talking about another idol that is so under the surface of so many things that we have. In fact, when we talk about greed and mammon, you may not relate to it because mammon isn't the idol that you're worshiping there. You've got a different idol that you're worshiping. This idol that we're, that we're talking about today is the undercurrent of our motives for so many actions, including the job promotions we pursue, the, often the true pursuit behind money. It's actually even the true idol behind most abuse and manipulation. It's the idol behind every lie, behind oftentimes behind our own physical health and physical fitness, behind a pursuit of study, education, and learning, and is even behind things as simple as the dyeing of our hair the, uh, or, or, or unique piercings and things like that. And, and, and thing, these are all rooted in the same God, the same idol that we're building up. And it's the same idol that caused countless failures in Scripture. It's the idol that caused King Saul, first king of Israel, who started out so, so good, and failed miserably, so much so that Samuel goes, you're done. The anointing has been lifted. Your child, this, your family doesn't even get to be the next king. I'm finding a new one. It's the same idol that was worshipped by Abraham when he chose to make Ishmael based off of his own ideas. It's the same idol that caused Peter to rebuke Jesus and therefore get rebuked and called Satan himself. It's the same idol that caused King Nebuchadnezzar, the strongest, mightiest man in the world, to find himself wandering in a field, a crazy man eating grass like a cow, losing his mind. It's the same idol that actually was the reason it caused Adam and Eve to sin. And it's the idol identified in Deuteronomy 8. The same, we just read this, Deuteronomy 4 and 5, and then Deuteronomy 8 comes right after. This is the unveiling of the law of the Lord. And it's an incredibly powerful passage. The Shema is what we were referencing earlier, Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5, when it's the peak of all the laws. Uh, they got like 300 some laws, and they got 600 all these other Jewish oral laws that they've got. And this, these, this is it. I am the Lord, your God. I am one. Love me with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. And then as he goes on to elaborate this, he gives this warning in Deuteronomy 8, 17. He says, you may eventually say to yourself, when you find blessing, if you follow me, you will be blessed. This whole passage before is talking about all this blessing that I'm just going to pour out for you. And then he says, you may say to yourself, this power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. Look at all I've done. It's the same thing when we look at where we were and we look to where we are now. It's the same pride and it's the same root behind here. And if you look at, so this was originally written in Hebrew, but the, uh, but, but the uh, not the Pentateuch, what's the word I'm looking for? Septuagint, thank you. Uh, the, the, the Greek translation of this that was used for a very, very long time, it uses the same words. I know Greek way better than I know Hebrew, and I don't know either very well at all. But I know books that do. And uh, the, the Greek here, it talks about my power and my strength, and it, it gives two words for this. It says, my power is dunamos. This is the word that talks about my ability my ability to do something, but then it uses a different word for strength. It uses the Greek word kratos, which is the word for divine 
rule, divine power. And it's the word that's given the name to the God Kratos. If anybody, any gamers in the room know the game Gods of War? God of War or something like, right? Like, keep your hand down. She said, he's putting his hand up. She's like, keep it out. No. Kratos. The interesting thing is that he is not the God of War. Ares. Ares is the God of War. Kratos is the God of strength, of power, and of sovereign rule. In fact, he's not even really known in, in Greek mythology, he's not even known fully as like a god, but maybe he's just like this spiritual entity that partners with Zeus and partners with these gods as what are they trying to do? They're trying to gain power. And when we talk about power, when we talk about Kratos, when you talk about this God and this idol that America and that we have built in our lives, ultimately, when we think about this, we're like, oh, I know, I know power, people who are power hungry, right? I know people that just want that. I know people that are looking for that. But almost never do we attribute that to ourselves until we realize that the root of this is not power, it's control. It's what we use Kratos for. It's to gain control. And this, and Kratos, Kratos was used by, by Zeus and by multiple gods whenever, when they're trying to overthrow and they're trying to create ruling and power and authority for themselves. And they'd go and use this strength. In the same way we have this idol. We may not find ourselves to be power hungry. We may not find ourselves to be particularly controlling. But we do find every single one of us has an idol and a pull to be the one in charge of where I'm going. I want to steer my ship. I want to be the one who's in control. Yes, God, I give it to you. Jesus, take the wheel for about 10 seconds right now. Right? We all have this. It's, it's this idea of like, I want to hold on to the steering wheel. Anybody like this when you're like, hey, if I'm getting into a car, I'm driving. Right? Like, anybody like that? I know. I, I, so, yes, it's the idea of like, hey, thank you for offering. I know it's your car. I know I'm not on your insurance. I'm driving. <laughs> not that I don't trust you, but I, I don't. I don't. I know what I like. I want. I need to know where I'm going. I need to know where I'm turning. I want to be in control. That is is this idol. And oh my, do we love the idol of Kratos? Do we love the idol of control? Do we love this? In fact, there's so many different ways to be able to identify this idol. There's so many different ways, but really, uh, when, when we see this, oh, hey, let, me, let me highlight some of these. Uh, control might be an idol in my life. If I pick I can find it in my occupations and extracurriculars. If I'm picking my workplaces, my friend groups, my churches, based off of familiarity to me, rather than calling. If I'm basing it off of what I know, what I'm comfortable with, what I like, maybe even some may go, some, you may even find it to the extreme of when I'm in my friend group or when I'm around family and I feel like I've lost control of the conversation or the decisions being made, I'm feeling this thing stir up. And I don't know what decision is going to be made. And I don't know if I'm going to like it. I don't know if I'm going to agree with it. I don't know. Maybe it's something as small as where we're going for lunch. But I want to make that decision. Or I don't need to make the decision, but I want you to make the decision that is mine. Right? Like, I, that's what I want. I want this. I want this control. Maybe it's when we find ourselves in a place where influence is more important than obedience. This is where we see 
the, uh, the, the Jezebel spirit. Jezebel was a queen that loved to hide behind King Ahab. She'd love to turn his head and direct him and make him, he takes the fire, but I am telling him what to do and where to go. It's the same spirit that caused Absalom, King David's son, to go and make friends with so many people. Let me help you out. Aren't I great? My dad's not. Don't you wish he was a little bit better to you? And starting to rise up his own following to go against his father. It's this, it's this, it's this idol of control when I choose to, when, I, when influence is more to me, important to me than obedience, right? Here's another, when in relationships, it's when we're asking ourselves the questions, what's going to make them promote me? Here's one for me that I have in relationships when I look at someone and I got the right answer. Not like, I'm not sure, you kind of got like, do your thing, right? And, but I know, like, I'm like, oh, this is black and white. I know exactly what to do. And I'm like, here you go. Just take path A. This is it. The Bible's clear. The evidence and the logic around you, it makes sense, right? Where are you going? You go get to go this way. And in this, everything, it, it just it stirs up this anger inside of me, this frustration. I want, ultimately, I want to will you into the right decision. Now, here's the other thing. I'm not God, right? So I'm pretty dang sure I'm right in this situation, but ultimately, this is that same idol that's coming up, and I'm going... I want to get you to a place that's better for you. But I I want you to follow my decision because this is the right. And when they don't, that's when I feel the idol rise up. Now, it comes from a good thing of like, oh, I want the best for you. But when I'm noticing that it starts to stir up anger and frustration in those things in my heart, I'm realizing that is coming back to the same times of my high school friends when I first was saying these things and, and my friend Ryan is running away from the Lord and I'm like, and I, I'm like, God, what did I do wrong? What did I say wrong? Did I not help him? Did I not lead him? What's going on? Why didn't I do this? Why can't he just listen? Why can't he just change? And God goes, I've got him on a different path than the path that you want him to go on. God says, I don't want behavior modification. I want heart transformation. And if you just want them to do the right thing, they'll be numb. They'll be stuck and enslaved in religion as opposed to actually discovering truth as the source of transformation. And yet I still, no, right? I still want it. I still desperately want it. There's other ways that we see this idol rise up. When we've got, uh, uh, in fact, a lot of times in, if we got any studious people, any people with masters, doctorates, degrees, a lot of times, what are we trying to do? We're trying to gain control by means of understanding. I want to be able to grasp this thing. I want to be able to understand more. And that is the, that's the problem that's the God behind the, the scientific revolution that's going, that, 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 that started to go. Science was originally created to be discovery of our creator, of God and his design that he has made. And then people started to go, no, I think I can use science to prove against God. I think I can explain a way so I don't have to come to terms with a creator. And we, and, and in the same way, I want to know, and so therefore my knowledge gives me control. This is Adam and Eve's original sin. The serpent says to them, eat from the tree, and you will know good and evil. You'll be more like God. If you know that, you'll be powerful. That's the original temptation. 
And we got to recognize this idol in our lives that it's not, it's the whole premise is God over science. And there's no real clear way to go like, this is the line. If you've crossed this line, now you know you've created an idol out of it. But I know that if I'm going to science before I'm going to the Lord, it before if I'm going to the next magazine or the next Google search idol and I'm looking up what, what the scholars say, I'm looking up what the stats say, I'm looking up what WebMD says before I go to prayer, then I know that that's telling me something about where I'm leaning first and where I'm trying to get my sense of control based off of what I know. Here's the time when this happens. The best opportunity for this is when you get a call from the doctor saying, hey, that test came back a little weird. We got to come in and and have, have you do another test, do a little biopsy. We'll find out the results in what feels like 10 years, right? Like it may be a week, it may be three days. I don't know what it is. But that period, before you get the results, that's your moment of surrendering control of knowledge. Because my understanding of the situation doesn't change my control of the situation. It just feels like it does. I just feel like I can grasp it. And that's why Israel loved this. That's why we love idolatry today. That's why at the foot of Mount Sinai, when the mountain's on fire and earthquakes are happening and it's crazy and God is there and Moses is up there and they go, let's make a golden calf, right? Because I can't, I don't know, I can't control that. That's scary. That mountain up there, that God up there, that sovereign, powerful one, I can't control that. But you know what I can do? I can shape this thing. I can take it where I want to go. I can sacrifice to it. And here's, that's how idolatry worked. I, I grab my idol, that God of that idol fills that idol and now I'm close to that God and I can call on that God and I can sacrifice to that God and I can say, oh, would you help me with my land, with my crops? Oh, would you help me with my, with that I would have wealth? Oh, would you help me? And, and I would offer these sacrifices and try to gain this favor. And what we realize is that we think we're trying to attribute the real power and control to the idol, but where is it? The, the, the best picture of this I find is uh, Aladdin. Any Disney fans? Come on, right? In Aladdin, you got this little uh, diamond in the rough, this little poor dude that's coming through. And, and, uh, and, and what do you get? You get this powerful genie, this enormous power in it. It'd be leaving space. Remember that? Yeah, yes, come on. Thank you. And the whole purpose of this, what happens? Who has the power? Genie. But who has the control? Aladdin. Right? So we find out that this amazing, awesome, huge, powerful genie is actually a slave. And we like to pretend the same thing with our control, with the things that we have, with the areas in our life where we are trying to control decisions, where decision-making, if, if I go, if it's not my way, it's no way. When I find myself in a, in uncomfortable in a place of ambiguity, or whenever I know God's will, but boy, do I want to choose my will over God's word. These are the opportunities when we like to make an idol out of control. And I think if I can just make these sacrifices and I can just gain this control, we think when we make these that, no, 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 God's in charge. God's in charge, right? No, God doesn't work in this idolatrous way. He's not up there going, all right, listen, I need this percentage of church attendance from you in 2023. I need to make sure that you've read through this many verses and chapters of the Bible. And if you do these things, then yes, I will. No, the reality is, is that God is sovereign. He is in control. I am not. 
The Lord is not in heaven going, oh shoot, they're asking for this and they really gave a lot for, I got, oh no, they're over here and they're asking for, oh man, I really got to help them. Oh, what they did, oh, I really got to help, sir. He's our servant. He's our slave. If that's how it works, if I do good and then he gives me good, who's in control? I like to say it's him, but I am in control. And when I recognize that control is actually never in my hands, it's like the having, having, having a helm, a ship wheel in our hands, but it's not connected to the ship. <laughs> I want to go this way. I think we're going that way. Maybe we are. Maybe I am going that way. But the reality is, is I'm not the one getting us there. This becomes a powerful reality when we find that control is lost. Every single thing that we think we are in control of, we don't hold any ounce of control. We think we do. We think we got ourselves in our job. We think we got ourselves to the place where we are in life. We think we have turned ourselves around. We think we have done the good. We've probably, like they were the bad person. I was, the, I was in the right in that situation. And I want to say there is... When we, when we look at idolatry, how do you defeat idolatry? How do you defeat it? Because it, is a, it has practical influences, but it's a spiritual problem. Ultimately, idolatry is a spiritual issue. So you have to defeat it spiritually. Ephesians 6, 10 through 15 talks about how to defeat spiritual powers. We are not fighting against flesh and blood. I'm not fighting against you. You're not my enemy. I'm not your enemy. We've got a different enemy that's coming in. We're fighting against powers and principalities. And that's actually one of the other times when this word kratos is used. We're fighting against a spiritual thing. And we've got, a one, we've got the one who has kratos, who has sovereign rule. We have him on our side. And so when you go to fight idols, how do you do it? My favorite picture of this is actually in 2 Kings chapter 23. If you guys want to turn there, uh, there's a whole, actually, if you want to read from 2 Kings 17 to 23, it's gold you'll see all sorts of idolatry and attacking and trying to overcome and false and, and lies and, and all this. And, and there's so much in it. However, what we see here is King Josiah. King Josiah becomes a king at eight years old because his father, the king, was murdered. He was assassinated. And so at eight years old, he's now the king. He doesn't know what he's doing. At 26 years old, what is he doing? He, he, he is actually the first king that's considered a good king for three generations. It was his great-grandpa that was a good king, King Hezekiah. And before him, there was, what's the matter? It's seven other generations. He's the first, there's two kings and 11 generations Whatever that means before Hezekiah, right? Okay, do the math without me. Uh, so here's the, here's the king, and Josiah is learning all these kings, everybody that's come before him, this is just the way you do it. This is just how you handle it. It's how everybody else works. If you want to, if you want to be in charge, if you want to, you have to gain control. It's okay if you kind of give a little white lie. It's okay if you kind of manipulate this decision over here. It's okay if you're chasing after those things because what is that? That's self-empowerment. Yes, give yourself the power. Oh man, I, I'm, not, I'm not good with power. And then we see Josiah come in. 
And King Josiah, what he does is he's trying to restore the temple of God and it's been like torn, it's, it's, it's been like a mess. And he's just like, can we just paint the walls so they look good again and clean it up a little bit? And, uh, and as they're painting, they find Deuteronomy. And they read the book to him. How many times have you received the word? And it's exactly what you needed. And then you get the moment of being able to decide what you're going to do with it. Maybe it's happening right now. Where God's highlighting something in your heart. And he says, what are you going to do with it? What does King Josiah do? He stands up. Tears his clothes and he says, we have sinned. For generations, we have created idols and we have worshipped the wrong God. We have been doing it wrong. And immediately he transforms. And this is what he does. He goes into the temple and he tears down. The actual, the temple of the Lord had idols all over in it. In fact, it had rooms, little little uh, quarters of the temple that was reserved for uh, prostitute worship and going in and having prostitution for the sake of worship and idolatry and in going in and he tears down and he tears out all this stuff and then he goes on a tour through all of Judah and he goes through all of Judah and he tears down every idol he tears down every place of worship he goes over to idols where they're worshiping Moloch and they are having child sacrifices in order to gain favor and control, he tears down the idols, he destroys it, and he kills all the priests that were telling them to do that. He goes into every home and he clears out all the household idols. And he calls people to the temple and he says, this is who we will be. In the nation of my heart, I can't take idolatry lightly. Because this is what the enemy wants to do. He's saying, listen, Pastor Drew, you're getting all worked up about this. You're making kind of a big deal out of something that's not really a big deal, out of a little thing. And I would argue, according to the word and according to the history of mankind, that we are making a little thing out of a big deal. When it comes to idolatry, when it comes to how we treat this, how must we treat idolatry? We must tear the idols down. If we can stand up real quick, and I want to read Psalm 115. Psalm 115 shows us, talks about idolatry. Can we go back at the first verse, Psalm 115.1? In Psalm 115.1, and uh, it talks about idolatry, and it's talking about how do we, how do we, what, what does idolatry do to our hearts? And I want for us to, to, to look at this introspectively, okay? Lord, not to us, it starts with the first couple of verses, not to us, but to your name be the glory. It starts with praise, Right? Because how do we tear down idols? Do we remove them from the throne? No, I place God in the throne that he deserves and everything else falls away. Not to us, but to your name. Because of your love, because of your faithfulness. Why do the nations say, where is their God? All the other nations had idols. They have no idols. They have no thing to go, that's our God. So all the other nations are saying this. Now our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him, not whatever pleases me. But their idols, their idols, they're silver and gold, made by human hands. They have mouths, but can't speak. They have eyes, and they can't see. They have ears, but can't hear. Noses can't smell. Hands, but can't feel. Feet, but can't walk. Nor can they utter a sound with their throats. Verse 8. Those who make them, those who follow them, become like them. So do all who trust in them. Here's the thing about Kratos, about control. I'll find my world crashing down around me. 
when I realize I'm not able to get control of my situation, of my health, of my relationships. What we find when we start giving into idolatry is we're left blind from seeing what's actually going on. We're left deaf from hearing the truth of what we actually need to hear. We're left with hands that can do nothing and feet that can't get us to the right direction, paralyzed, stuck. This is the opportunity. How do we tear down the idol of control? We drew it aggressively. And then verse nine, go to the next slide here. Now all you Israelites, trust. Trust. Let go of the wheel. Stop pretending like I got control trust. You are a help and shield. House of Aaron, church of collective, trust in the Lord. He is your help and shield. Anybody who fears God, trust in him. He is your help and shield. He is my victory. He's my protection. And guys, I can tell you, man, I, I don't know what the enemy is doing, but I can tell you that there's some spiritual warfare going on on the team. There's some spiritual warfare going on in our house. It's real. And we're fighting a spiritual battle. And I don't know if Satan's going, hey, stop calling us out. But I'll tell you what, control was attacked in my heart this week. The things that I thought I knew the things that I thought I was confident in, what I like to control, the things I like to identify, and and I think are even good things. I'm a pastor. I'm, I'm, I'm I'm a faithful steward of the Lord. I am a husband to a beautiful wife. And I get a phone call, and my wife's been T-boned in an intersection on Friday. The Lord is protected. But man, the enemy, the enemy, it's like he's trying to say, you don't have control. I've got control. And I look at him and I go, oh my gosh, I'm so thankful, God, that you've protected because you are in control. God is in control. When I want to manipulate situations, when I want to manipulate my God and say, hey, if I will you, he is in control. And what I want to do is I want to offer up a time of surrender here. I'm going, Lord, I give you all control. And if that's you, come on forward. Anybody that goes, I am surrendering. I'm letting go of this ship wheel that I'm trying to control this thing. And I surrender. God, I saw, I'm not believing the lie that I have any sort of control. And I go, God, I know it is safer to be in the hands and under the authority of my God than it is to be in the hands and under the authority of my own will. And I surrender control. I give up control. And I'm going to, it doesn't mean I'm inactive. It doesn't mean I don't care. It means I trust. It means I work diligently, not banking on a result, but banking on my God showing up. It means as I serve in my, as, as I look at my friends, I don't look at what, how does this glorify me? How does this help increase my power? I look at him. It means when I look at the word of God and I look at my own will and I go, I'm gonna choose you. I don't like it. 
I don't want it. I don't even know if I fully understand it. And he says, good. If you understood it, you would have a bit bigger sense of control and it wouldn't be as big of a faith step for you. I'm asking you to follow me anyway. And in this, in this, ultimately, we gotta tear down the idols. We gotta aggressively abusively tear these things down and go, I'm putting to death anything in my life that looks like me trying to hold on. I'm apologizing to my friends, to my family. I'm choosing to serve instead of be served. I'm choosing to just surrender. And this is ultimately the call that all of us are given, that the Lord gives to every single one of us. He says, I've got you. You're safe in my hands. Will you just trust me in that? Because your control is a facade. That's not what it, you're, you're with me. I've got you. And the greatest, one of the greatest acts of surrender is saying, Lord, my life is yours. Maybe that's you for the first time ever, or maybe for the first time in a long time. And as an act of surrender, if that's you, would you just put your hand up going, God, my life is yours, and I'm giving my life to you. Would you be my savior? Maybe for the first time, maybe for the first time in a long time, and I gotta do that. I see your hand, come on. Yes. You're not alone. We celebrate with you. Come on. God, I need you. What I want to do is I want to make sure that we're responding. If you, if you, if you put your hand up, you can grab a friend. But I'd, I'd, love, I'd love if you could come down just so that we could partner with you in prayer. And what I want to do, I want to offer an opportunity because we have baptisms but one of my favorite stories about baptism in, in Scripture actually is, is obviously I should, as the pastor, say Jesus' baptism is my favorite. But the narrative actually behind the baptism of the Syrophoenician eunuch was, uh, or Ethiopian eunuch, was this, is this story of, of Philip walking along a road. God reveals this man to him, and they talk the guy goes, who is this lamb that was to be slain? Who is this savior that I'm reading about in this Bible and in Psalms? What, what am I supposed to do with this? No, it was Isaiah 53. It's like the best passage that prophesies the Lord and uh, prophesies Jesus. And he goes, what do I do with this? Philip's like, well, I mean, actually it was Jesus. And he's just like, he was just here, just like in the last year. And this is what happened. And, and, he, and he showed himself and he revealed himself and then he died. He was murdered for the sake of our sins, but then he rose again and he was exalted. And even death can't overcome this God. Even death can't overcome my God, my Savior, my Lord. And then and, and this Ethiopian eunuch goes, oh my gosh, this is incredible. I want to give my life to him. What do I do? And, he's, and he goes, well, what you do is you say, God, I give you my life and I believe that you're the Lord. And then you get baptized. And he goes, cool, there's water. Let's go do it. He did. And Philip goes, well, I don't see why not. Let's go. And in the same way, I want to offer that opportunity to you. We have people who have made the decision of going, I'm going to follow Jesus. And they've signed up. And they, but, but I also want to offer the opportunity that the Ethiopian eunuch was offered, that Philip offered to him. If you've given your life to the Lord, or if you're saying maybe for the first time, Maybe you still got questions. You don't have to. If you raise your hand, you don't have, this is not an obligation. We just want to, we want to be able to walk beside you. But if that's you and you go, I want to commit my life. I want a public declaration of this private decision that he is my Lord. I am not. I'm following him and any idol in my life, I'm ripping down and I'm saying, you God are my God. If that's you, I want to invite you to come up right here to Caleb. Right here, can you throw your hand up, Caleb? What I want to do, because what I want to do is I want to make sure that we can, we got shirts 
for you. We got a change of clothes. We got shorts for you. You got no excuses. We got towels for you. If you want to get baptized, come on up and we're going to be able to help you walk through this and get baptized. If you go, I've given my life. What am I supposed to do next? Publicly declare, let's do it. Let's do it. If that's you, find Caleb right now because I'm going to get ready myself. I'm going to go get changed. And what I want to do is I want to ask real quick. I just want to say this prayer over every single one of us. Can we pray? Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, how silly it is of us to think that we can control our own destiny, that we can control those around us or even the situations that we are in ourselves. So Lord, any blessing that we have, we declare Deuteronomy 8, 6, that no, God, I thank you for that blessing. Every good, every perfect gift has come from you. And that you have allowed it. You have allowed that blessing. And every darkness, God, that you're still sovereign over it. Every hurt, every pain in this room, every trauma, every abuse, every fear, you are still over it. We trust you. We trust you. So Lord, I just pray right now in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I declare any idols, would you identify them in our lives, in our hearts? God, I pray against distraction. God, I pray. We submit to you, we surrender to you. And God, I trust in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks so much for watching today's message. Our prayer is more than the words that were spoken in the message, that you would remember the things that God spoke to your heart. Yeah, no matter what it was that God spoke to you, I know that part of your journey is other people, being in a community, because we are better together. So if you made a decision to follow Jesus today, would you click the link below and fill out the form? This is gonna help us so that we can celebrate with you and equip you with some tools so that your next steps are great steps. Yeah, thanks so much for watching. We're praying for you. We're cheering you on. We believe that the best days are ahead of you.